Understanding your religion, the seven major doctrines that define Christianity. This is the 15th lesson in that series. Today we're going to be talking about the sub-doctrine of justification. The title of that, of this lesson, is Becoming Acceptable to God. Now, I keep kind of reviewing over and over again you know, at the beginning because this is just a lot of material to kind of hold in your mind at once. So forgive me for that, it's important to do that. Uh, so we, uh, we can understand each individual sub-doctrine and how it fits into the, how it fits into the, hold, uh, into the whole. So I said that you know, there are seven major doctrines and when I, when I got down to the fifth major doctrine, which was the doctrine of reconciliation, you know, how God reconciles man back to himself, I told you that that particular major doctrine is explained through 10 sub-doctrines. Okay? And uh, uh, the first five of those sub-doctrines are the sub-doctrine of election, where, uh, God, uh, where the Bible explains how God chooses Christ. That's the doctrine of election. The second sub-doctrine was the one on predestination. That explained the idea that God knows the end result of His choice uh, you know, at the very beginning, because He is God. He knows how things are going to work out. His choice of Christ will succeed in his goal of reconciling man to himself. That's the doctrine of predestination. The doctrine of atonement explains how God has chosen to pay for the sin of man, the moral debt of man's sins through the atonement, through the payment of Christ. That's what the doctrine or the sub-doctrine of atonement explains. You know, this, this, this vicarious exchange, you know, an innocent life for a guilty life, and so on and so forth. That's the doctrine of atonement. Subdoctrine of redemption explains what happens because of atonement. Because of atonement, God frees man because the debt of our sin is now paid through Christ. And that's what the doctrine of redemption explains. And then the fifth subdoctrine was the subdoctrine of regeneration. And that explains what happens to man because he is redeemed. Because he is redeemed, he is now regenerated. He is now free, free to live a new life. You know, whenever you read born again, or somebody talks about born again, and someone were to say to you, what's the, what's the preacher preaching about? Because you know, he's all preaching about born again. You could say, well, he's, he's, he's explaining regeneration. He's finding a way to, to preach on the doctrine of regeneration. Okay? Then I said, these five sub-doctrines, election, predestination, atonement, redemption, and regeneration, this is the plan of salvation. So when somebody says to you, what's the plan of salvation? God's plan of salvation is He chose Christ and He knew that His choice of Christ would succeed. And Christ came to earth and died for our sins. That's how our sins are taken care of. And because our sins have been taken away, we're free. Free from what? Free from condemnation and death. And because we are free, we are now free to become children of God. We're regenerated. We're born again. Okay, so if someone, you know, if you're saying, well, I'm going to preach the gospel to this person, or if someone said to you, tell me what the gospel, I always hear the good news, and I always hear, you know, what, what is it? Well, this is, this is what that is. Those five sub-doctrines, that's the plan of salvation. All right? Uh, and, and again, you know, I, I mentioned, someone said, well, where's baptism? Well, where's, well, there's a place for baptism and repentance, faith, and so on and so forth. You know, I've said, that's the response to the plan. How does man respond to God's plan? Well, he responds with faith and repentance and baptism and faithfulness and so on and so forth. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, then I said, the next five sub-doctrines um, explain the plan of salvation from different perspectives. Okay? So the next five sub-doctrines, for example, explain the uh, plan of salvation from a human perspective. And so that, that's the doctrine, of, or the sub-doctrine of adoption. You have the sub-doctrine of justification. That sub-doctrine explains the plan of salvation from a legal perspective. Then you have the sub-doctrine of perfection. That sub-doctrine explains the plan of salvation from a heavenly perspective. And then sanctification explains it from an 
inward perspective. And then doctrine of salvation explains the plan from an eschatological perspective, meaning at the very end of things, when all is said and done, what does the plan of salvation actually do? Well, you know, the doctrine of salvation explains the whole, you know, the, the, the plan of salvation explains it from its end. Okay, everybody got that? All right, so let's go to the next one. Last time we talked, we looked at the doctrine or the sub-doctrine of adoption. And I said to you that the doctrine of adoption explains how God has adopted us back into being His sons and daughters. And so it explains salvation from the perspective of becoming God's children. You know, the, the writers explain the very same thing over and over again using different metaphors, using different ideas, using different examples. And those five sub-doctrines are like five different ways that the Bible authors, well the author is the Holy Spirit, but you know what I'm saying, five different ways that the Bible writers chose to explain the, the plan of salvation. And so in Ephesians 1, and Galatians 3, Romans 8, Romans 9, Paul is explaining salvation using the motif of adoption. How because of reconciliation we were, you know, we were lost, we weren't sons and so on and so forth, and because of reconciliation now, we, we now have become adopted sons and daughters of God. Okay? So the thing that was separating us from our Father was sin. That sin is taken away by Jesus. We are now free. We are now liberated. And as free and spiritual living beings, we are now worthy to be adopted by God to become His sons and His daughters. Sinners are condemned to be punished. Those people cannot become sons and daughters of God. Okay? So now we move on and we're going to look at the sub-doctrine of justification and how this doctrine explains God's plan of salvation from the perspective of the law from a legal perspective, okay? So justification as a doctrine is based primarily on the idea that God is the final judge of what is ultimately right or wrong. God is the one who decides this is good and this is bad, simply by speaking it. You know, the creation, if you read the creation account, the creation remained neutral until God proclaimed that it was what? Very good. It was neither good nor bad, it was just there. But once God said, this is good, then that, that's what gave it its moral dimension. God is the one, when God said this is a good thing, then that thing is good. And when God said this is a bad thing, no matter what man says, that thing is a bad thing. He's the one that determines the moral value of everything. So the commandments, you know in Exodus chapter 20, where Moses is, receives the commandments, so the commandments given in Exodus chapter 20 verse one codified the standards that God established so that the Jews would know without doubt what was good or what was bad, what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. God said, you should have no other gods before me. Well, that meant that worshiping a lot of different gods, that was bad. And worshiping only one God, the true God, that was good. God said, you, you don't make any images, don't make any statues, don't, don't do that. By saying that, he made the, the use of images and statues and so on and so forth in worship, he made that a bad thing. Until then it was, you know, it could be argued either way, but he codified it. He said, that's bad. Well then that's bad. That's always bad. And so on and so on. Wanting your neighbor's uh, lawnmower or a wife or car or you know, desiring, lusting after it, God said, that, that, that's bad. And so that is forever bad. See what I'm saying? All right, so what this means 
is that God has a right to judge because He has the wisdom to establish the rules and He has the power to enforce the rules. Why do we obey the traffic laws? Why don't I just, you know, I'm driving and it's the afternoon and it's quiet and there's no traffic anywhere. I can see you know, the stop signs up ahead, but I can see there's no cars coming for miles. You know? But why do I stop anyways? Well, that's the law. But you know, why not just zip on through? Because I know if I zip on through, no matter if nobody's there, I've broken the law. Uh, and there might be a helicopter up above you know, looking down. <laughs> And so the state establishes the law. Well, you go, so what? Well, but the state also has the police to enforce the law. So God establishes the law and He has the power to enforce the law. Now with God, however, the ability to establish and enforce and judge is based on His absolute wisdom and power. You know, we don't give God authority through consensus. That's democracy, that's politics. You know, we vote somebody and we give them the, you know, the authority to make our laws and so on and so forth. That's what, the system that we live in. But we don't give God the authority to do anything. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need our consensus. Okay? He doesn't give up any of His authority, but He does reveal in His word what His standards are and a guarantee that He will enforce them in judgment, right? Let me get to that scripture. In Romans chapter two, he says, but because, well, Paul talks about, it, he says, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life, but to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. And so <laughs> God spells it out very clearly. I make the rules, I make the laws, I will and I will enforce them. If you obey them, you'll be rewarded. If you disobey them, you will be punished. So, you know, so the sub-doctrine of justification is, is looking at salvation from the perspective of legality, what is right and what is wrong. So the doctrine of justification is explained assuming a system of absolute right and wrong. So in this context, we start our study of the doctrine of justification. Now to understand justification, we need to first understand that it is, explained, it is explained against the backdrop of an absolute standard of what is right and what is wrong, established by an all-powerful God who will judge the entire world against the standard that He has established. So if we understand that God has established a standard and will judge all men according to that standard, then we will begin to understand the sub-doctrine of justification. This is the ultimate reality proclaimed by the gospel and espoused by, by Christians. You know, when you're preaching the gospel, remember you know, the plan of the gospel? When you're preaching the gospel, um, you also have to preach the idea that there's such a thing as being lost. You know, some people say, wow, that preacher is preaching you know, uh, hellfire and brimstone, or well, that's pretty tough. You know, he's, you know, but we're going to scare people away. Well, people don't repent unless they're convicted of what they're doing, that what they're doing is wrong. People don't seek salvation unless they understand that they're lost. If everybody is okay, well, what's the point? Why? There's no need for salvation, right? So the problem today in our society, why it's so difficult to preach the gospel, is that most people promote the idea that there is no absolute standard in the Bible or anywhere. There is no right and wrong, in the sense that right and wrong is what right or wrong for, right or wrong for you personally. You know, like that woman, and I, I should have written her name down, I lost, she, she was claiming that she was an African American, but she was actually a white woman. She was Caucasian, her parents were Caucasian, they had pictures of her when she was a little girl, she was a little white girl. 
and uh, she grew very sympathetic to the uh, civil rights movement, it seems, and, and began working in that and began identifying with African Americans to the point where she began to dress and fix her hair and even claim that she herself was African American and nobody was questioning her. She even got to a point where she was the leader of, is it the NAACP, one of the chapters in one of the cities, you know, and then all of a sudden somebody blew the whistle on her. And people were saying, well, you're not, you're not African American, you're white. You know? And I saw the interview of this woman, one-on-one -on -one interview with the journalist, you know? and the journalist just came right out and said to her, but you're, how do you respond to the idea that both your parents are Caucasians? There are pictures of you, uh, you know, as a little girl, as a little white girl with, you know, with pigtails. And she said, well, this is my truth. <laughs> wow. She said, this is my truth. In other words, if I believe this is true, then that makes it true. And she was simply spouting you know, what decades of ideology we've had here in the West, this relativism that says, you know, what's good for you is good for you, what's good for me is good for me. There are no absolute standards. What's right for African Americans is right. What's right for Caucasians is right. What's right for you know, uh, Native Americans is right. You know, cultural, the, the cultural morality. So we get to the point where there, there's no ultimate right or wrong. You know, it's all relative. So it, begins very, it, it gets to be very difficult to preach the gospel to people because they can't be convicted of any type of sin because you know, homosexuality, right? If it's right for me, if that's the way I feel, that's how I express myself as an individual, so on and so forth, then it's right. Doesn't matter what the Bible says, doesn't matter what anyone says, you know, it's right for me. You know, the 9-11 um, the bombings, you know, that had a real sobering effect on the people that promote this idea of relativism, what's good for you is okay, what's good for me is okay, because they could not you know, condemn the people that did this without violating their personal philosophy about relativism and morality, because some uh, radical Muslim would get up and say, well, you know what, that was what was right for us. We consider America uh, an enemy and they've been harming our people and we have a historical uh, you know, uh, claim against uh, America because we blame them or we blame the West for a lot of our problems. And so these men, these martyrs, you know, they're justified in what they're doing because this, this was right for us. Well, I want to tell you, all the relativists here in the United States <laughs> They, had, they, they, they started thinking, you know, because this horrible thing, these innocent people that were murdered for somebody's ideology, they couldn't quite get to the point where they said, hmm, well I guess that's, if that's right for them, I guess it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not okay when it's your wife that gets killed, or it's your grandchild that gets burned to death. You know what I mean? Then all of a sudden, whoops, I need to recalibrate my morality here. So until recently, it's been hard to preach the gospel because people refuse to accept the absolute nature of God's standard. This is how it works. If there's no standard, then there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, well then there's no need for salvation. You know, people say, well, you know, the church is in decline. You know, and churches everywhere are in decline, and they are to a certain extent. And people are saying, well, that's because you know, we don't have enough programs. Oh, well, that's because you know, we, uh, you know, for us, you know, we ought to, we ought to uh, put to instrumental music. You know, that would draw young, you know, they come up with all these reasons why you know, churches are, well, churches are, 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 are not growing because they're not preaching the gospel, that's why. Churches grow when they you know, sow the seed, sow the seed. But the seed is being sowed on very hard hearts. The seed is being sowed on very thorny ground here because in the West, you know, uh, the worst sin is being intolerant. The worst sin in our society is saying that somebody else is a sinner. <laughs> so you know, if you happen to be a Christian and a preacher and you call out the 
certain group for being sinful, the worst, you've just done the worst thing. Like, I'm the worst sinner as far as this society is concerned because I step up on an electronic platform which is called the internet and I call on the world and say, you people are sinners, homosexuals, fornicators, and idolaters, and worldliness. You know. And the answer back to me personally is, no, 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 you're the sinner because you're intolerant of all these people. You're a racist, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe. So, you know, a new awake, what we need is a new awakening of the presence of absolute standards and that will press the case for the gospel and also clarify the meaning of the doctrine of justification. So anyways, I, I, I'm just kind of digressing a little bit here just to, to demonstrate the idea that uh, people don't respond to the gospel not because they don't love Jesus, they don't respond to the gospel because they don't see themselves as sinners. They love Jesus, they've turned him into a liberal, <laughs> I, I saw somebody with a sign that I, I, you know, where you can't even begin, you don't even know where to begin to explain how messed up it is. I saw a person with a sign marching in a gay pride parade that said, are you ready? Love wins over faith. <laughs> and, and, and what they were saying is, Love, meaning the love between two men and the love between two women and, the lo and loving people that are like that wins over religion. I mean, do you even know where to start to <laughs> pick that apart? You know? So, anyways, those are the obstacles to explaining what justification means as far as the gospel is concerned in our society. But I think here this morning, we're, we're speaking to a uh, friendly crowd, so I think you'll, you'll get the idea of justification. So, uh, if you want to understand the sub-doctrine of justification, you have to begin with the idea that there's an absolute law, an absolute standard established by God. All right, so in this context of absolute standards, we begin to understand that one of man's greatest needs is the knowledge and the assurance that he lives up to God's standards and thus is approved. Listen, all of this business here about accepting you know, th this type of morality, and I, I go back to gay rights because that's the stuff that's in the papers. All of this is to make acceptable something that has historically been unacceptable. That's all it is. They're trying to do it through laws and through political pressure and through shaming individuals and through lawsuits and movies and you know what I'm saying? But when you strip it all down, they're just trying, a lifestyle that has been historically condemned as evil and wrong wants to be made acceptable. Well, the only way sinners can become, quote, acceptable is through the gospel, not by changing the law. So, We've learned that sin deprives us of God's approval because it causes us to live below His standards. And this situation, it causes fear and guilt and anger and despair because we are created to be happy when we obey and unhappy when we don't. That's the point. Have you ever kind of, have you ever been kind of um, challenged by something, I don't know what it is, you know, somebody has offended you or said something mean-spirited or whatever, or, or you've been tempted to gossip, you know, you've got a juicy piece of gossip that's come your way and somebody comes by and it's, you, know, you could kind of pass it on and blah, 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 and your mind says, you know what, that, that information is just going to stop with me. I'm going to bury that information. I'm not going to be the one to, to continue this story about this person. And so you, you see your buddy and that your buddy is saying, so what's new, what's going on? and that little piece is circling in your mind and you say, yeah, nothing, you know, everything's good, you? And then you walk away and you say to yourself as a Christian person, you know, yeah, I did the right thing. I was tempted to kind of pass it on, but I did the right thing. I kind of, you know, I kind of shut my mouth for a, for a change. You know, I, I bit my tongue, I didn't pass it on. I, you know, I praised the person in particular, instead of you know, passing on the gossip to kind of lower them. Yeah, you feel good, why? You did the right thing. 
it's always good to do the right thing. Well, the, the, the opposite of that is true as well. It's it always harmful if you do the wrong thing. For example, if you had thought about that and you said it anyways and you shared it and blah, 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 and then you know, five minutes, it might have been fun for that few moments when both of you had a bit of a laugh at the expense of this other guy. But when that was over, as a Christian person and you thought about it, you know, you, usually you say to yourself, ah, man, me and my big mouth. You know, I, sh I shouldn't have done that. So you feel good when you do right, and you don't feel good when you don't. And you know why that is? That's the way we've been created. So those deprived of God's approval, but not conscious of it, they still suffer symptoms of a soul separated from God and will suffer the final consequences brought on by this condition. At this point, anxiety and fear and dread, and then at the judgment, condemnation and punishment. So some people, you know, they believe that ignorance of these things will save these people at judgment, but that's not what the Bible teaches. That, hey, that's not even what human law teaches, right? You, you, the, the cop pulls you over and says, you were doing 54 in a, in, a, in a 40, and you're saying, well, I could have swore that was a 45 sign that said 45 or said 50. No, you were wrong. Well, I didn't know. And then the cop says, oh, you didn't know. Well, okay, it's okay then. Just, you, know, you can go ahead and you know, try to be careful in the future, you know, and have a nice day. No, 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 no. What's he do? He gives you the ticket anyways, right? Why? Because ignorance is not a defense. You didn't know? Well, you know what? After you finish paying your $220 ticket, you will know. <laughs> you will never drive this down this street past 40 miles an hour again. I don't know about you, but that's how it works with me. So some people believe that ignorance of God's standard is what will save them. Not true. The Bible says that ignorance is present within men's heart because men purposefully suppress the very truth that would guide them to God if they would just let it. Where does it say that? Romans chapter one, Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against, listen, all ungodliness. Does he say against some ungodliness? Or against the ungodliness of those people who know it's ungodliness? No. He says all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. So what's the within them? God, you know, he, he made it evident within them? What's the within them? Well, that's your conscience. Maybe if you never read Exodus 20 that says, thou shalt not steal, right? Maybe you never read that. But if you're living in a tribe somewhere and you know, in a jungle and you go into the next hut and you steal your neighbor's whatever, your conscience is going to bother you even if you've never, you know. If you steal your, your neighbor's wife, if you kill your neighbor's child, even if you never read the commandment that says thou shalt not kill, uh, yeah, you're not jumping up in joy. Your conscience, that's the internal guide. And then he says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. So he says, from within you know, why? Because he's given you a conscience. And then he says, and you know from without, why? Because he says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Well, seen where? The millions of stars, <laughs> the trees, the Grand Canyon, the being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So you have an internal witness of God, your conscience. You have an external witness of God, the creation, because every single human being, and even if they've never read the Bible that said in the beginning God created the heavens and earth, looks around and says to themselves eventually, where does all this come from? How does this work? And so he says, so that they are without excuse. Let me give you one more yeah, it goes on. He says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. 
professing to, the, to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of a corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So nobody is saved by default because they don't know the truth. I don't mean they don't know the entire truth about Jesus and the, you know, the redemption. And, uh, I don't mean that. Rome, uh, Paul is saying here in Romans, people can know that there is a God, internally and externally, and they can begin searching for Him. And what he's saying is that basic innate knowledge he says, men have purposefully submerged. Uh, when I did a study of the, 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 uh, the words here about you know, they've, they've, they've submerged the truth, the idea is, you, you, know, you, take a, you ever take a, um, a beach ball and you go into the pool and you take a beach ball, you know those multicolored light beach balls, and you take it and you push it under water. What happens if you let it go? Well, it'll pop up, right? Well, this is what Paul is explaining. The truth there is buoyant. It's there. And he says men have suppressed it. The truth wants to pop up, but men have purposefully suppressed it. And what have they done? They've exchanged that truth that wants to come out with a truth of their own. And they've worshiped birds and the sun and other men and so on and so forth. And he says, and because of this, all men will be, all men will be judged. So um, let's see, uh, no one is saved, yes, by default. The Bible says that everyone can know, but they suppress this knowledge. In addition to this, the Bible also claims that even those people who do know the truth, you know, that they don't measure up to the standard of God, these people are helpless to change. This is a sad reality. Let's look at some of the scriptures here. It says seven, he says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me, this is Paul speaking, that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not even one. And then one other passage in verse 323 says, or chapter 323, for all of sin and fall short of the glory uh, the glory of God. So three passages where Paul is saying, you know what, even the people who know the standard of God and want to live up to the standard of God, they're not able to do it. They fall short. So there is a sad reality here. The sad reality is that, uh, yeah, uh, the sad reality is for the people who don't know and who have suppressed the truth, they stand condemned. Paul said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. And then the real sad reality is that even the people who do know that there is an absolute standard and there is a God and there is a judgment, even these people cannot live up to it as well. There's the paradox. That's why he says everyone is condemned. The ignorant are condemned because of their ignorance and the ones who are enlightened are condemned because even though they know the truth, they can't live up to it, okay? So this is the problem that the doctrine of justification addresses in explaining God's salvation. All right, that's the end of this particular class. This was just the setup. So we've got the stage here, we've got the setup. You're condemned if you're ignorant, you're condemned even if you know. Well, how do we get, you know, how, do we, how does God solve this dilemma? Well, the sub-doctrine of justification answers that question, and we'll do that next week. You can hang on to your sheets if you've noticed the, the back part will continue. It's kind of a two-part thing, okay? Very good.